What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and to continue my brand new series of classical movie reviews, I'm here to let you know that The Last Picture Show is no perfect movie. I don't care if it has 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, it's not perfect. We'll get into why later. But The Last Picture Show is a coming-of-age story about a kid named Sonny Crawford, played by Timothy Bottoms. Try saying that with a straight face. I've tried. It doesn't last for very long. And over the course of a year in 1950s Texas, he and his friends, Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepard, learn about the harsh realities of adulthood and try their best to run away from the possibility that they may grow up to have lived completely uninteresting and uneventful lives. Very cheerful stuff, I know, but I was interested in checking out this movie without even knowing the story just because I like coming-of-age movies. I think they can resonate with anyone if you do it right anyways. <clears throat> The director of this movie made another black and white film called Paper Moon, which I think is incredibly underrated. Look for it if you haven't seen it already. And it was interesting to check out Jeff Bridges, Sybil Shepard, Cloris Leachman, Randy Quaid in the 10 minutes that he has in his first movie ever, giving performances when they were at a much younger and more unrecognizable status. And the best thing I can say about The Last Picture Show is that the acting is incredibly top-notch. It's the best quality about this movie for sure. Timothy Bottoms, all jokes aside, gives an incredibly good performance as the main character. He obviously, he obviously blends in with the movie a lot more than the other actors who have become A-list Oscar winners. But since he's the main character, he's the one we follow the most. And he has to go through a lot of different emotions as a character for the first time once he begins to accept more responsibility that he may or may not be able to handle. And the ones that he can't handle, the emotions that he never experienced before, he has to go through them over and over again to the point where, as a person, he has had it up to here with the stress levels. That's a hard thing for any actor to accomplish, let alone a 19-year-old in his second role ever. But dude really rises to the occasion and gives such a sympathetic performance, even though near the beginning of the movie, you don't really like him at first because it sets up who he was as more of a more of a rebellious and very outspoken person who once he once he's entering adulthood, he has to realize that there are things that he's not able to do anymore and things aren't going to be as fun as they were before. And at first, I didn't really buy the chemistry that he had with Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepard when he's being friends with them, but as I kept watching and I kept being patient about that, it became really clear to me how intentional that is, because these characters, as teenagers, live under the impression that they can only rely on people their age in order to get along in life, and they find out the hard way that sticking just amongst other teenagers actually gets you further up shit creek. It isn't until they come across the only adults that they let into their life where these adults share stories of their own past and just let them know, hey, uh, you don't have to say it, but I know how you feel, which I think we've all had moments like that growing up, and we still do as adults. It's always, it's always important to look to the older generation, learn about what they had to learn through their own mistakes so that you can improve upon yours, and that's a really big message of the movie. Speaking of which, the adult actors in this movie really surprised me because there were some that I had already recognized and the ones who were honored at the Oscars were already pre-established stars as opposed to the actors who were becoming famous after this movie came out. Obviously, people have talked about Ben Johnson and Cloris Leachman, and rightfully so. Leachman gives I don't think she's given a performance like this throughout the remainder of her career. Someone who is a new figure in Sonny's life, she apologizes all the time for these bursts of emotional sadness, even when she doesn't really need to. And she finds out over the course of the movie that she really doesn't have to because she's one of the few people in this town who are very open and honest about how weak and vulnerable they are. And she begins to question the people in her life saying, I show myself I'm an open book. What's your excuse when you act stupid in front of other people? The only reason she really has to apologize to anyone is just to make sure that they don't leave her 
And you kind of wonder if she really even needs people like that in her own life. And you kind of realize that the people that she's trying to depend upon only feel awkward around her because her sadness just reminds them of their own sadness. Ben Johnson, who wasn't really known for an actor, but more as a stuntman and as a sidekick to John Wayne in many of his John Ford movies, he was, he's the gruff, he's the character with the gruff exterior who has a heart of gold and... You know, those characters can be instantly likable, and watching him on screen, it's really easy to see why. He is a character who does harbor a lot of hidden secrets. He does hold grudges against other townspeople when they've wronged him or wronged his family. But he's a great judge of character when he's willing to show forgiveness to the people that have mistreated him. And he's willing to offer words of wisdom from the mistakes that he's learned in his own past, especially this really good monologue about a lost loved one that, without a doubt, got him his Oscar. No question there. And it was definitely a good monologue. But one actor that I don't think gets enough credit for being in this movie is Eileen Brennan, who most people would know as Mrs. Peacock from Clue. Some people might know her from Murder by Death 2. But as the town waitress that everybody really likes, she's unique amongst the other characters in that she has a bitter and sarcastic but also compassionate and well-meaning side to her at the exact same time for basically the other qualities that Ben Johnson has as a character. I'm surprised she really didn't get that much Oscar consideration. She's in the movie as much as any other adults in this movie are. But let's talk about Peter Bogdanovich. Bog... <sighs> You know what, I... Everybody gets names wrong. It's really not that big of an issue. Let's get to him as a director, because he has some strengths that make this movie good, but he also has some weaknesses that kind of were the big issues for me. The decision to film in black and white as opposed to color was actually a decision that he had while having dinner at his house with Orson Welles, because this dude actually let Orson Welles live at his house for two years when he was in the shitter in terms of making money, but the decision to film this movie in black and white does feel very necessary because it suits the setting of 1950s Texas and these characters' feelings towards nostalgia and past mistakes. It really does elevate the substance and the style becomes very unrecognizable and invisible because you're so busy focusing on the actors and what they're talking about. And in regards to filming dialogue conversations, Bogdanovich is kind of like other 70s era directors like Hal Ashby or Sidney Lumet, where they weren't concerned about making shots that would call attention to themselves or call attention to the movie as having a style. They were more concerned about drawing attention to the actors. In any scene, they tried their best to put as many or any actors in that scene as possible in the same frame so that we as an audience can look back and forth between characters as they're talking, it raises up the stakes because as you keep looking back and forth, you have no idea what each person is going to say. It makes it a little more unpredictable, and it gives audiences the illusion that the scene feels very energetic, but really it's just another mundane moment in life that you can relate with. Scenes like that are really effective. The things that aren't really effective about the movie that really weigh it down mainly revolve around the pacing. This movie takes place over the course of one year, and as opposed to fading into certain moments or slowly building up to other moments in the future, you don't really get that. You get a scene that takes place in one month, and then in a split second it'll go to the next without much transition. And I get why the director did that. He wanted it to feel as if... The past felt like it was yesterday, but now it's completely gone. I understand why he did that. But I felt like using fade-ins or fade-outs were a much easier way to have audiences sink into it. Because I get that that's a feeling that we all have as people, but that's a reality thing. We're watching a work of fiction. We can suspend a little disbelief when you use a fade-in. In fact, a 70s movie filmed in black and white, I was kind of expecting more fade-ins just to go along with it anyways. Sometimes during scenes, you can actually guess that right away whenever there are holiday decorations or certain clothes or haircuts, stuff like that. If anyone who complained about not following Little Women, I can't see why you would have any problem watching this. 
But what really bugged me was the things that happened in between, you don't really see. You just get very quick conversations where it's just like, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this and that, and then I'm about to do this later on. And it just felt lazy, rushed, and forced, especially when the writing revolves around side characters who come and go in those exact same scenes. I know the director is trying to build this sense of community where everyone knows everything about each other, which also kind of took the stakes out of certain scenes because some of these characters engage in really obscene and risque acts of sexuality and among and violence among other things that somehow were really offensive in 1971. I'm not entirely sure how, but that's a completely different conversation. Seeing things like that happen on screen and just be like, whoa, that was intense. What's going to happen? And then the other characters say it in such a nonchalant way. It's just like, that completely took the suspense out of it. What was the point of that? I know I didn't have that much to say in this review as opposed to what I said about being there, but being there was just such a huge surprise and was so impactful that it ended up being one of my favorite films over the course of one night that I just had to spill the beans about fucking everything that I saw. This movie was good, but it wasn't 100% Rotten Tomatoes good. I can usually agree with movies like that anyways, because movies that are held in that, in that high of a regard usually have a lot more going for it. This is a more simple coming-of-age story that is relatable to a certain extent no matter what generation you grew up in. It's just the way that they navigate from certain scenes and certain periods of time just felt forced and rushed to the point where I couldn't where I couldn't really get sucked into what was happening in each scene as much as I could have. But nevertheless, I still think this is a good movie, and if you have Crave in Canada or HBO Max in the States, it's worth at least one watch. And not gonna lie, in the future, I might have to re-watch it to see if my feelings have changed or have improved. So for now, I'm gonna give The Last Picture Show a 3.5 out of 5. Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen The Last Picture Show, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. And which one do you prefer if you've seen both, Last Picture Show or Paper Moon? I'm more personally in the Paper Moon vein. I have a silent review up for it, and I may actually do a an actual talking review now that I really want to rewatch that movie again to see if it still is better. But nevertheless, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Be sure to stay tuned for more classical movie reviews. I'm going to try and keep it a surprise each time to maybe have you guess which classics I'm going to review next. So be sure to stay tuned and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.